Hi, I'm uh, Jordan Shapiro, and uh, this particular session is going to be about um, about kind of max maximizing the, the, the impact of, of innovations in different um, in, in different economic levels. I guess I'd start by asking you guys just tell us about your work, and uh, how about we start with you, Jenny? Why don't you tell us about what you sure. what you do? Sure. Um, well, as you introduced me, I'm with the Center for Universal Education at the Brookings Institution, um, which is a think tank based out of Washington, D.C. Like any good think tank, we do policy research, um, convening, advising, but in particular, we focus at the Center for Universal Education on improving quality education, so both access and the quality dimension in low and middle income countries. Um, and my work in particular is focused on um, both the innovation side, as you said, but the scaling side as well. How about you, Cliff? Tell us about this, this Talking Book Project. Sure, yeah. Uh, yeah, so the Talking Book Project, I uh, uh, started uh, Literacy Bridge and the Talking Book Program uh, in 2007. And the, the goal is to provide life-changing knowledge to the very poorest of the poor people. So people out in remote rural villages, typically in developing countries, um, that have no other access to really fundamental things like education about how to um, uh, double their crop yield. There's a, a lot of knowledge there that can make a huge impact um, and so that's that's what we do is get that knowledge to people and we do that through audio recordings. Um, the reason for that is because um, we're talking about places with you know no electricity so what we did was we developed a, an audio device um, and that's what this, this talking book thing is, this, this here. And uh, it's just a device that's designed specifically for people in oral cultures so that they could access whatever information that they were interested in. So uh, education about health or agriculture, or gender issues, business. Um, and it's all locally recorded in the form of songs or dramas or interviews. It's really fascinating to me to think about what it means to, to try to use some of that technology with the uh, w w with an oral culture. Yeah, tell me about about how 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 you got to this point of, of this this device. Yeah, it was. Um, I mean, it was really just a, a, a lot of trying things out and uh, and failing a lot. Uh, I mean, to give you one example, the the way you navigate this, it's almost like a a telephone interactive voice response. You know, press one for this menu option or two for this. Well, people may not have numeracy skills either, so you don't have numbers on here. You have symbols that you could quickly identify in a language, uh, in in any language, and. One of the things, one of the mistakes we made was having uh, too many levels of hierarchy. So like that, press one for this menu. You know those frustrating, annoying things? Yeah, well, it may frustrate us. You would completely lose someone when you go into like the second level of hierarchy uh, for someone who hasn't been to school. I like to use the word failing and learning from that because I think, particularly in education, we don't, there's a lot of, I think, lip service to this idea of failing and how important it is to fail, but I don't know if you found this in the work that you've done. There's not a lot of support for that. Whether it's financial support, whether it's you know academic publishing support, you know yeah. we don't want to talk fund here about failures, even though we recognize there's you know it's an important part of the process and oftentimes more to learn. Jenny, tell 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 me a little bit about if if you had to look at, at how to think about this, right? If 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 you were in charge of all of all the money that, that gets spent everywhere in the world, right? And you, you had to think about what, what were the what were the categories, right? How you're going to think about how to how to maximize the, uh, in, investments in different kinds of economies, what would you look at? Efforts that have achieved impact at scale. Um, I think one would be around early learning. I think early learning in terms of there's overwhelming evidence that preparing young children um, for life, you know, nutrition, health, education, um, those outcomes persist well into adulthood. So preparing young children to get ready to learn, to go into school, I think is critically important, a great investment. Um, the second thing I would point to, and I think where we're seeing more and more evidence as well as interventions that are really making a difference, is around reaching student at the level where they're at. In 32 countries today, 40% um, of children, no, excuse me, 20% of children will drop out um, before completing primary school. So it's, it's, a, it's a serious problem. And so the importance of remedial education and giving children a chance to catch up, but really grouping them at where they are at rather than where they should be at for their grade or their age level. And again, to give an example, there's um, an NGO in India called the Pratham Education Foundation, one of the largest NGOs in India, education NGOs. And they have um, this methodology of teaching at the right level, they call it, where they do these very intensive um, bursts of 
activity. They group children by their, their level in both literacy and math. They focus very intensively, um, both sometimes with volu trained volunteers, sometimes with teachers, and they find significant results in terms of improvements in both reading and math. And again, at a low price point, um, you know, 30 to 50 days of instruction, somewhere between 10 to $12 per child. And then the third area I would say, and this might be more than you were asking for, Jordan, um, but I think it has to be something around teachers. I think you know what happens inside of a classroom arguably is one of the most important things in terms of learning outcomes, and I think teachers are critical to that. Cliff, now you now you do this. It sounds like uh, at least with the talking book projects, you're doing something very very different. It's not it's not as classroom ori oriented as what Jenny's describing. I think I'll ask you the same question. For the types of uh, stuff that we're doing with this kind of non formal education or um, skill specific training, um, I think that there are some general principles. I don't know if there's there are that many examples where there's been really solid research of things that have scaled up really big, like on a big, big global level. So I think uh, if I had all the money in the world, I think there's some principles that I can talk about. But, um, but what I really want to do is, is kind of put these things to a test um, and, and, and see what's working. So for us, um, uh, I guess understanding the, the target market is very important, understanding in terms of what infrastructure is available. And so you've just, you've really got to question um, what is the existing infrastructure, how is it being used? Um, and, then, uh, and then in terms of um, you know, the cost effectiveness, I think that uh, the, the effectiveness part is, is really key. What, are, what is it that you're trying to change? You've both talked about, about scaling, right? Um, and I think one of, the, um, one of the kind of paradoxes embedded, embedded in the scaling question is, is, is how, do you, how do you both scale without over-standardizing? For the work that we do, um, a key thing would be around language. So, uh, there are, in, in a lot of these uh, countries that, that, uh, that would apply to the work that we do, there are dozens or dozens of languages or hundreds of dialects in, in some cases. You know, around the world we're talking thousands of uh, languages that, um, that apply to people who are, are the least served. So that's, that's a really key point, is if you're developing content, um, then that's your point of scale. And in the case of agriculture, um, around crops, uh, is it the right crop information for the right uh, uh, soil conditions or something like that. So those are the kind of things that, that, that we would look at. It's a good question you asked, Jordan, because it's something that I know with Millions Learning that we've been grappling with. I'd say what we found looking across a range of case studies is that many of them sort of occupy this sweet spot between the more rigid replication and the more sort of costly customization. That there's a spot where it's more of a flexible adaptation, if you will. Um, a recognition of what are those core components that are not negotiable. They should look the same everywhere. That no matter if we're in Ghana or if we're in Kenya or if we're in Brazil, these pieces will always look the same. But beyond that, the rest of it not only can look differently, but really should look differently depending on the local context. Is there a place Cliff, where, where you where you kind of make the jump from the from this kind of the, the skills that you're you're dealing with the agricultural skills and nutrition skills right uh, is there a place where you make the jump to these kind of 21st century skills I think that it might be a mistake if uh, if we uh, only if we exclusively focus, say that um, for the very poorest of the poor it's got to be like they they need food agriculture skills they need to fight disease health and and you don't get into any of these other things um, so I've had some conversations with people lately talking about things like um, the importance of empathy and entrepreneurship and uh, and um, you know, things like that these softer things that I think if we were to totally exclude them um, it, it might not we might be doing a disservice I also wonder in an effort like yours if those skills are embedded in your work and it's just implicit in what you're doing. I mean, when I think about some of the 21st century skills, soft skills, transferable skills, insert any word you might like, um, you know, I think about from what I've heard, you know, when you were showing me the, the um, talking books, is it is about collaboration and it is about communication and it is about critical thinking and I think whether it's explicit or not in there I think those are the kind of skills that you actually learn through practice through agricultural practice through you know taking care of your child much more in many cases than sitting in a classroom and certainly being lectured to um, so in some ways I see an effort like this being a great channel um, to learn those skills yeah thanks for bringing that up because uh, that probably comes through most when we do dramas
dramas. And in our dramas, that's probably where um, you know, more of the empathy and, and some of these other things come out is, is that the way these situ situations play out, especially around gender, is exposing people to new ideas about how a community can be stronger together when men and women are, are going out to the farms together when they work, you know, or just little things like that. When are we proselytizing to, 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 to our, our version of culture and when are we, when are we really helping? Yeah, I mean, I imagine it's something you, you have to ask yourself often. Yeah, I think uh, for us it's always at a very local level. Yeah. And, um, and so we, in every, every uh, um, project that we take on, we're always right in between uh, a partner like UNICEF that has very specific objectives and on the other side the community and what the community um, feels are, are their needs and their particular challenges. In some cases, um, that they're com in complete alignment. But there are cases where um, you, uh, you know, if you're talking about family planning or something like that, if, if that's something that you're trying to introduce into a community, um, that's going to be a much longer conversation with some communities. Um, and the way you phrase it, and not just the way you phrase it, but doing uh, the formative research where you go in there and understand how do you view this issue now. And child, early child marriage is another example. Um, if your daughters didn't get married so young, what might be good about that in your community? And, and getting the community to generate these ideas themselves uh, rather than sort of trying to secretly implant them. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it is a little balance, especially around health issues where there are things that make a difference in mortality rates and we assume everyone wants to live longer. Yeah, I, I guess I would just add, I mean, I'm thinking back to a process that we worked on um, at the Center for Universal Education. We co-led a process with UNESCO um, called the Learning Metrics Task Force and it involved thousands of people from around the world, organizations, communities. And the idea was we're talking a lot about learning. I think to your earlier question, quality education and learning in particular, but how are we defining it? Um, and so that was really the exercise. What does it mean, not in Washington, D.C., but what does it mean globally in localized context? And then how do we go about measuring it? Because we know measurement is critical, right? We can't improve what we don't know. We certainly can't begin to measure what we can't even define. So it really was this you know, two-year conversation and dialogue to really get at, I think, what you're saying is how do we begin to define this in a global way that we can begin to make comparisons across countries and communities while recognizing how very, you know, contextualize the concept can be. Um, certainly can't speak to all the challenges and nuances around it, but I would say where we came out was to recognize, we, we um, collectively identified certain domains of learning. So what were the big areas of learning that appeared to be important across various cultures, communities, um, you know, religions and so forth. And then within each of those, it was really quite, you know, specific to that locality. Um, so that's how we approached it. Yeah. That's, that's great, I, and I, I think um, that, uh, that relates to, uh, I think a little bit back to what you were asking about before with scale. Mm -hmm. So for, uh, for someone like me, you know, someone running a, a, a nonprofit organization, uh, the bigger the numbers you can talk about impacting, the better, right? The better your credibility will be, the, the larger partners you, you may want to reach. But this is dangerous because um, you have an incentive to say larger numbers, and so then the question is, what exactly is happening with it? So I can tell you that we impact today nearly 200,000 people. Well, um, as we start looking at you know, getting that to one million and beyond, we're realizing that we need to be very specific about what do we mean by impacting. Um, I mean, we, we've, we've been specific about a lot of things in the past, but we need to start standardizing on this. And the reason it's good, especially internally, is to hold us ourselves accountable internally to say, let's not get sucked into that uh, doing something, making decisions just to get to bigger numbers unless we're really, we're executing on our mission. And, and so, and then, you know, there's the mission, but the very specific thing of what really changed for each of those 200,000 people. And are we confident with that? Are we happy with that? Okay, let's move on and do that and not just throw around a big number because we have the incentive to, to kind of get into the big number space. I'm glad you said that, Cliff, because I think with a lot of the conversations around innovation and scaling and frugal mm -hmm. innovations, I think there's a real danger that we need to be, you know, cheaper, faster, bigger, yes. better. And yeah, the reality zeros. is, yeah, more zeros, yeah. as you said. Yeah. And I think to your point, and I imagine to your experience is, 
it it's a long-term commitment, mm -hmm. right? It takes, as you were saying, iterations. Yeah. It takes um, long-term investment and support. Um, it's not going to happen overnight, mm -hmm. um, or at least not at the quality that you want to yeah. have, um, you want to achieve. So I think that's a, a real important sort of cautionary tale. Yeah, and there's a little bit of competition, you know, in the sure. the nonprofit space. It's it's the uh, um, you know, like when you hear your colleague, you know, in another organization say, well, we reach a million people, and, and so the donor starts, well, let me talk to that, that one. So it's, I, I do think it's really important. It's too easy to, 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 to find a reason to start talking to these big numbers. Is, is, a, is a real problem with humanity. It's a, it's a massive human injustice. And so, so for me, the reason we talk about scale is because that's what we're trying to address, is the, this massive injustice at a global scale. And so to, to, um, to stop with 200,000 people, it's, it's great for 200,000 people. You've done something useful for 200,000 people, but you, you haven't actually started with this, you know, this big human injustice problem. So that's kind of how I think about in terms of scale and yeah. you know, what we're trying to do. Yeah, well, well, thank you both. This has really been an inspiring conversation. Thank you.